Hi everyone, um, welcome to this uh, industry talk at Vienna Shorts. Um, this is uh, Those Who Care About Curating Today, which is the second event in their uh, Fusing the Worlds focus. Um, so we're going to be talking today about um, curatorial practice and ideas from different perspectives and arts contexts. Um, we're going to look at collaboration, audience and artist engagement and uh, general strategies to improve what we do as curators. Um, it's a conversation in collaboration with Talking Shorts and Be Short Now. Um, you will be watching this either on the festival's YouTube channel or on the website or on the festival hub. Um, but for any questions, um, please go to the festival's YouTube channel. Um, you can put them in the live chat there and they will be fed through to us. Um, any links that are mentioned during the conversation will be posted in the YouTube chat and they'll also be available later on um, when the uh, conversation goes online. Um, and then I'm very happy that I've got three guests with me today, so welcome everyone. Um, we've got Renaud Poch, um, who's the Executive and Artistic Director of Independent Curators International. Ilaria Conti, a curator and founder of the recent conversation series, Altering, Shifting, Communing, and Anna Henkel Donnersmark, the head of Berlin Alice Shorts and also one half of Short Salon. So um, thank you very much for, for being here for this conversation. Welcome. Um, I would like to uh, sort of start off with all of you maybe introducing yourselves a bit, your background and your current work, and then also sort of the art contexts in which you operate. So Renaud, if we can start with you. You're on mute. <laughs> it starts well. Uh, Sunny, thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm uh, Renaud Proch, as you said. I'm the director, artistic direct, um, executive and artistic director of ICI. Uh, ICI is an organization that uh, produces exhibitions and public educational events uh, and professional research initiatives for curators. Um, we're based in New York, but we're uh, uh, working in places around the world with curators in up to 70 countries around the world. Um, and we focus on the role of curators because um, they are quite central in the uh, arts ecosystem. They support artists, advance new ideas um, and scholarship about art. They develop infrastructure like art spaces uh, for the presentation of contemporary art. So that's really some of the reasons why uh, well, we work on um, uh, with curators and enjoy working with curators. Um, and our main goal, I think, is really to foster independent thinking and innovation and experimentation in the curatorial field um, within or outside of art institutions. Uh, so, uh, you know, to do that, we focus a lot on collaboration, which I think we'll talk a little bit more about um, today. Thank you very much. Um, Ilaria? Thank you, Sana. Thank you, everybody, for having me today. It's great to be here with, with all of you. So as you mentioned, I work as an independent curator, and I'm currently based between Europe and the United States. Um, for the past almost 10 years, I would say I've, I've worked, however, in institutional context. Most recently, I was uh, at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and in New York prior to that. Um, now, as a contemporary art uh, curator, I focus on research-based practices that engage with colonial histories, with decolonial epistemologies and strategies. And therefore, I'm very, very interested in artistic and curatorial practices that are collaborative and that cultivate civic agency, communal care, knowledge sharing, and also practices that address the infrastructural issues of our field. And I guess we'll get to it later, but really what the role of institutions are, what the role of labor is, um, how to cultivate ethical processes for our work, and also deconstruct certain hierarchies of people and knowledge and nurture relationships with communities. So um, I focus on this through curatorial projects, and with this I mean exhibitions, of course, but also through discursive practices that are not object or artwork centered, and that can really cultivate new forms of knowledge, of awareness, of advocacy, of solidarity. Um, so I'm curating several projects rooted in, in all of this, um, while really leveraging the possibilities of discursive platforms. And so you mentioned before, Altering, Shifting, Communing, which is a project um, that I initiated almost a year ago, a little over a year ago, and it is an ongoing series of conversations on curatorial practices. It is hosted by Call for Curators. And in this framework, I invite 
practitioners whose curating and curatorial practices really operate outside of traditional institutional context and also rethink critically the processes, methodologies and infrastructure of curatorship. So we can talk more about that in a moment. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Anna? Yes, hello. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, so I take care of Berlinale Shorts, which, which is the short film competition of Berlinale. And a year ago, I started a project called Short Salon together with Sarah Schlüssel, who's also like a cultural manager and specialist for short film. And um, my background is I'm actually trained as a filmmaker. I went to film school in the last century. I already started working for film festivals back then. I've worked for several film festivals, either as member of the selection committee and or as moderator of the film talks in all kinds of different contexts, but it was always short film. And, but my main profession until a year ago or two years ago is actually doing video installations for exhibitions and for uh, stage productions, theater, opera, things like that. So it's kind of commissioned um, video art. And since last year, I'm yeah, in charge of Berlinale Shorts, who I worked for as member of the selection committee for 12 years before that. And just one word about Shorts Along, because I think we can go into more detail later on. Shorts Along, I'm looking at my notes, they are down here. So Shorts Along creates space for dialogue between film and society. We use short films plus whatever um, to create events where people come together and think and talk and engage with a certain theme or topic. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting because it's obviously a very varied um, set of contexts and approaches. So I look forward to seeing where it goes. Um, I guess, yeah, I want to start with quite a, a broad question um, about, you know, you've, you've each talked a little bit about this already, but the, the sort of your own priorities and interests um, in your own practice. And that could be, you know, in general, or maybe sp like specific to the institutions or, or, or projects you're doing now, but um, sort of what you consider in recent times, what the sort of main challenges, challenges and opportunities are for you and what you do. Um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Bruno, do you want to go again? You're on mute again. <laughs> It'll get better. Um, well, I, um, okay, challenges and opportunities. Um, you know, I think that uh, working with, uh, um, well, obviously the challenges are, you know, the past year has been basically bringing us challenges that we couldn't even imagine on pretty much all levels. Um, and working internationally, uh, as we do, has been very difficult to, you know, to continue doing um, with travel restrictions and so on and so forth. But also, you know, working with a network of curators and artists uh, and art spaces, uh, there's a, a sort of emotional uh, challenge as well that's uh, that's been very real in the last year. And um, um, trying to, you know, be supportive in, in uh, other ways where, people had not only logistical challenges, but also uh, very personal challenges uh, has, has been, um, you know, has definitely impacted our work in the last, um, in the last year. Um, maybe more generally, I think that uh, one of the biggest challenges in the field that uh, we've identified is that the, the, the world always seems to me more complex than what I see in museums. Uh, the, the, uh, the work of artists always seem more complex than what I see in museums. And it's not to criticize museums from the get-go necessarily, it's, it's to say that I think that there is, um, we live in, in a state of such complexity that, um, uh, you know, one voice, one space, um, one form of presentation of, of art uh, is, is just not going to, uh, to be able to reflect that type of complexity. So. Um, we really believe, I think, at the core of what we do, that um, that we need, um, you know, um, a, multi a multiplicity of, of, of voices um, and uh, and perspectives on art, but really on on um, what art reflects on, which is uh, really the world. So, um, and you know, I I, uh, I can go a little bit further, but maybe I'll just say a couple of ideas that if if they're interested. Um, 
to Ilaria and Anna, we can, we can uh, discuss more. But I think that the institution, the art institution, the museum uh, has also undergone over the last, um, not just the last year, but over the, the last decade, maybe a kind of crisis of identity that has been both a challenge and an opportunity for us, you know, sort of, um, you know, museums have been, um, especially in places where museums are, are very common in society in, you know, in, in Europe, in the US, um, I think museums have, are having to renegotiate um, the, the art history that they embody, the colonial legacy, the role that they have within society. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's, that's been a sort of in, in interesting challenge as well. Um, and, you know, other histories needing to be told also within the museums, that's been one of their challenges. And not all the solutions have been technology based, right? So in the last year where a lot of um, um, programming has have uh, tried to reach new audiences and tell different stories through uh, a digital platform, I think that's not been the only um, uh, kind of way to do it. And even those even if those practices have received a lot of support, I think that there's a, a lot of rethinking about public spaces that, that um, uh, we've come across at ICI that we found very interesting, um, you know, in terms of opportunities right now to, um, to meet the, the um, today's challenges. So rethinking public spaces, rethinking direct action, community engagement. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've in the last uh, year, we at ICI produced a number of public, uh, public talks around uh, curatorial um, models and, and work uh, and projects such as um, Any Given Sunday that took place in 2016 in Cape Town um, to much more recent uh, projects, Di Balcone, uh, which took place last April and again just this past month in Berlin um, as a sort of neighborhood-based public art initiative. Uh, no Straight Line in Paris, um, Al Aire Libre in Chile, and uh, a few in many places, which is produced by uh, Proto Cinema in, in um, Istanbul, but is an exhibition that, that's taking place in different cities around the world. So all of these are sort of models that we found very interesting uh, in their uh, renegotiation of, um, you know, art, public, public spaces, uh, and sort of taking place outside of the art institution. Um, and yeah. I'll stop there and if there's ideas that sort of interpelled everyone we can come back to them. Thank you. Um, yeah I'll pass on to Alara. It's interesting you mentioned Proto Cinema because I think that's maybe your next guest on the series. It is. It is. Uh, <laughs> Mary Spear from Proto Cinema is the next for altering shifting community but I think that the overlaps of course are strong and, and, and they make sense beyond this particular time. I think it's important to recognize the work of practitioners who've been working in this direction for years, beyond the state of emergency of our field. Um, uh, going back to your question, somewhat tracking back a little bit. So I guess I've mentioned already a few of the things in a way that animate my work. Um, in terms of, you, because you asked us also about priorities besides challenges, and that's where I wanted to somewhat get started. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that it, overall, um, one one priority that I could identify is that of ensuring the projects that uh, we engage with or give visibility to have a degree of civic agency. And it's something that I often think um, about because it's something that I encountered kind of early on in my path while I was studying and training and forming somewhat, which is a, which is a statement by the Rax Media Collective. And I'm not a fan of quotes, but I thought that that was something that has stayed with me so profoundly that I tend to repeat it just kind of naturally. Um, and they at some point said that the role of contemporary art is to make people think about their lives and consider other possibilities. And I think that was one particular line of thinking that somewhat has influenced very much my curatorial projects and definitely altering shifting communing as a, as a project. Um, and sort of stemming from that, I think the, the willingness to ensure that at the center of each project stands an element, a tool, a strategy, even something as simple as an idea that can really serve as a spark for a different degree of agency, for a shift somewhat in perspective and epistemology and relation. Um, so an example in this, again, bringing about also other types of curatorial practices maybe that I've cultivated recently. Um, and I was thinking about 
practical examples to bring to the table because otherwise it remains a little bit too vague was this um, project that was recently curated, I'd recently curated in Rome at the Barrochello Foundation, which was titled Prove di Resistenza. And it is a bit complicated to translate into English as a title, but I would say that the heart of the matter was this notion that I encountered through the study of sort of uh, decolonial studies, uh, which was developed by an Afro-Colombian artist and activist, Adolfo Luana Cinte, who speaks of resistance as re-existence. And so this is something that has been a guiding force also for the development of alter and shifting communing and many other projects before that. So how forms of resistance, whatever that might, might mean, are not simply rooted in an opposition to the status quo, uh, but are able to creatively reconfigure the very notions and building blocks of our lives, right? And so this is something that for me was important to place at the center of certain projects because it's just a nugget of information, some uh, a tool, an idea that you can take away with you and sort of maybe allows you to shift or reconfigure uh, certain, certain elements. So um, the, the idea is to present collaborative projects that are process-based practices and also that address this re-existent notion in a very quotidian way, uh, not big revolutions, but really to uh, not think about abstract terms, but rather through daily practices, right? Through suggestions that publics and other practitioners somewhat can, can take away with them. And I think with this priority, um, another one that is very, very important for me and that I try to encourage in these projects that we're discussing is the awareness of one's positionality or the awareness of my positionality. Um, because um, I think about curating as voice, as voicing, as having a voice. And so as also a platform that needs to be shared with other voices and resilient voices that perhaps historically had their agency on their mind or completely erased. Um, now in terms of challenges, in terms of opportunities, I think something that was really the spark that gave birth to Alter and Shifting Communing was the question of processes and of focusing on how we do things rather than just what we do. This is an integral part of the description of the project in and of itself. And again, working to develop tools um, to carry forward our work without having to replicate necessarily certain systems of power, certain hierarchies. And I think here also about hierarchies of knowledge, uh, not just more in a traditional sense. So um, trying to put aside for a moment what we've been knowing about curating or what curating could be and imagine um, imagine it as Renault also was saying, detached it from the institutions and really fully centered on what the somewhat the, um, the urgencies of the practitioners and the communities involved um, in a given project are. So through this question of urgency um, and shared urgencies. How do we reconfigure the work that we do and how we go about things? So, and I'll leave it there as well. Thank you. I think we'll touch more on these kinds of things once we come to talking about collaboration and, and inclusivity, obviously. Um, Anna, I want to go to you, I guess, with that original question, but um, you might want to touch upon what's being said, because I think for you, it's probably interesting as well that you're working partly in this, in this really big internationally known institution and then also have your own project aside that. So it'd be interesting to hear how those, how those sort of sit next to each other. Yeah. Um, well, I think whatever I do, I'm a perfectionist, so I like good quality. So I think that's what is hopefully always somehow there, at least that's my aim. And, um, and I really liked, Ilaria, the quote you quoted. I, I hope I wrote it down correctly to think about their life and shift their perspective, is that correct? Yeah, because I also wrote down like what is important for me as when I curate and when I think of the audiences, opening the horizon and shifting their perspective. So um, that matches very well. And I personally really like bringing people together from different backgrounds, from different experiences, whatever. And film festivals is a great way to do that. And at film festivals, you don't only bring people together, you also bring thoughts and films together, the thoughts that are within the films, the themes, the positions, whatever. So it's a really nice yeah, place to bring people together and then from there on broaden the horizon again. And as far as this sort of current situation is concerned, like what, uh, or I think at the moment, it's really important to offer possibilities where people can listen 
So it's not so much about discussion, I think, at the moment, where everybody has their own opinion and then you battle each other and whoever has the best arguments wins or whatever, which used to be for a long time the way of engaging with each other. And I have the feeling at the moment it's more about listening and there are not so many places where you can actually focus and listen and hand yourself over to whatever, a person, a piece of art, a film. And especially in the pandemic, for me not going, being able to go to the cinema where I hand myself fully over to a film and focus, whether I like it or not, but I stay there and watch it is something I really missed. And, and, and this... Yeah, to create a space where listening is possible. And for Berlinale Shorts for this year's selection, my I always have to write a little or do, do a little sort of headline for it, which isn't the theme of the, the selection, but sort of the theme of the approach. This year, it's tell me about yourself so that, so that I can understand the world. And that was sort of my approach, which, which is, you could do that every year, this headline. But I think at this moment in time, it's especially important and then you asked me about the sort of working in a big institution and doing little things on the side the good thing about the big institution Berlinale is we have a very curious and open-minded audience it's an audience festival I think we have 300,000 400,000 visitors in those 10 days and and this open-minded curious audience in general and short film audience in, in particular gives me a great freedom in curating because they want to be, I have the feeling they come to us because they want to use their brain and heart at the same time. And it's not just about being fed what they would like to consume, but more being offered or being maybe challenged, um, being yeah, addressed in a not as a consumer, but as a maybe art lover or as a thinking person <laughs> with a heart and emotions. Yeah. So that gives me a great freedom that we have this audience mm -hmm. that is there already. I don't have to, I don't have to courtship them. Yeah. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I want to move on to, to this, this um, well, to talking about collaboration, which a bunch of you have uh, already to discuss. And I think my entry point to this is, I guess, that for a lot of people, the, you know, the idea of curatorship, the idea of a curator is there's a sort of cult of the individual around it, like a cult of a singular vision around it, which obviously I think has been changing and, and that conversation has been developing. But I'm particularly curious for all of you individually how you, what your sort of approaches are to really, you know, nurturing collaboration and making sure that you step away from that that singular vision um, and I think it's interesting as well with Ilaria because you mentioned about you know like curating have, being a voice but also you know how do, what does that mean if you have to, if that has to be a, a multiplicity of voices like how do we integrate that and work together so um, Renaud I think can you start maybe again because I think for you that's also interesting because considering you're supporting curators across the world so yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I I loved what Anna said about um, about the the fact that so much of the work has been about winning an argument uh, traditionally and historically, uh, and I kind of want to tie it to that. And the, the I think the the for me collaboration and connection as you were describing it is a counterpoint to uh, to that way of working, right? To the idea that there is one singular vision to advance, the one that sort of wins an argument in some way. Um, and uh, I, I think that's that that really resonates with with me. And I think the 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 way that we work, so the 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 sort of culture, the cult of the individual that you describe, um, is problematic in that sense to me, right? Because it doesn't happen by chance or by magic. It's very much part of a design of a way of thinking of that idea that you know that we argue an, 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 an idea and then there was, a, there was a winning idea that sort of dominates the discourse. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, uh, is worth taking away. The idea of the individual, I'm, 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 I'm comfortable with. 
uh, you know, maybe it's because I've lived in the U.S. for for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think we we certainly support individual curators. I think that when Ilaria talks about voice, which is also a, a word that's very important to us, the curatorial voice, right? Uh, it's often the voice of one individual with a very important, um, you know, subjective perspective to communicate to the world. So I, I think the the individuality of, of the conversation is not necessarily, uh, or the notion of, in, of the individual is, is, is not what, um, what we're trying to kind of question. Uh, it's more the cult of the individual, the idea of the singular kind of uh, practice, the, the, which leads to a um, monolithic kind of, uh, of art world in, in some instances, right? Um, so that's something that I think, uh, it, collaboration is a counterpoint too. And so it's not just that we're uh, happily collaborating with in, in everything that we do. It's just that we're recognizing that if we're trying to not uh, subscribe to the validation of the cult of the individual, like suddenly we have, we realize that none, none of what we do is done alone, right? Um, and uh, in the, and especially, you know, for us, it's interesting because just to be a, a, a bit more specific, maybe for, for a minute, um, some of our programs, well, we don't really have a, we don't really have a space. Uh, and if you look at your website, which we're about to relaunch uh, in the next coming, well, in the coming months, uh, you know that we don't do a lot of programming online, uh, even though all the information is accessible from, from our website. But um, we basically work with other uh, art spaces uh, our exhibitions, our traveling exhibitions that are presented in museums or in, in, in art venues around the world. Um, our educational programs take place again in collaboration with um, art spaces. Uh, even the majority of our talks um, would be kind of itinerant and, uh, and take place in, in collaboration with universities or with uh, other venues. And so there was a, a not having a space kind of forces you immediately to collaborate uh, and uh, and to think about you know the singular perspective that you want to to bring forward with your programs in relation to uh, the you know other uh, singular perspectives that your collaborators uh, your hosts um, may have. So that's a that's a for us has been a a pretty. Um, um, kind of definitive way of uh, making sure that collaboration is at the center of, of, of what we do, you know, and to kind of oppose that idea of the, uh, the cult of the individual and, and the singular vision in that way. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, Ilaria, do you want to continue on? Yes, of course. So I agree that there is a problematic aspect when it comes to the notion of curator. I think it's a term that over time has accumulated so much power when it comes to the reputation and the system of control. I often hear still nowadays that the curator is the gatekeeper. This is something that we hear all the time in our field. And I still wonder whether that is an accurate description of what a curator as a professional figure should be. Um, I think I disagree with that notion deeply. So with that in mind, um, I would say that when I think about collaboration, I think about it as a methodology in and of itself. So as a process as, or sorry, as the process rather than as a characteristic of the process, if it makes sense. And as I said before, I try to, I try to work through my methodology while keeping in mind certain thoughts, ideas or notions that help me ground it in very precise ways. And, um, and so here, what I wanted to sort of offer or bring to the table is um, something that I often think about, which I read and was written by a marvelous um, Argentine feminist philosopher, Maria Lugones, who spoke of active subjectivities. And she speaks about the intentionality as something that lies between rather than in subjects. And so I think I'm trying to stay focused on the fact that collaboration is this constant exercise of somewhat being in between of educating oneself, myself also, to let go of the need to control this intentionality at every step of the way. And, and this is also where I feel that um, 
discursive methodology that I mentioned before becomes central because it educates me and it educates, I feel in general, uh, about how meaning and contents are formed together through a dialogical process somewhat, you know? So from a very practical standpoint, when I think about altering, shifting, communing or any other project, I feel really that the best collaborative endeavors are the ones where deep forms of listening are practiced. So again, going back to what Anna was saying before, and also where expectations are somewhat clearly articulated from the beginning. It seems banal, but I have learned through the work that it, this is not banal at all, I think. And then from there on, trying to design a process that fits somewhat the different subjectivities involved because for each project, each one of us comes in with a professional expertise, but um, what I try to work with and through is the fact that um, the process for each project cannot possibly be um, cannot possibly be the same. And so goes also for a conversation for an event like this one, right? If we want it to be really collaborative, it is a process of designing and making that effort of redesigning and adjusting and being in between at each single time. I think it's very fatiguing. I will not um, sort of sugarcoat it. I think it's uh, very time consuming and energy consuming because it's a practice of active listening again, going back to Anna. But, um, but I think that that becomes, that's how, at least for me, it becomes the process, the methodology, and in a way also the content in and of itself, rather than just being one of the many characteristics, because it's sort of, we need to reverse engineer that a little bit, I think. Yeah, I mean, I guess in, in you know, in relation to that, what, what you spoke about earlier, um, in terms of labor factoring into that, you know, the, the sort of resources or the time that is available for people to to really ethically think about collaboration, that is, I guess, a problem in itself, you know, that there's like a lot of time, not the, the space or the resources to, to do that. But we can maybe come back to that. Um, Anna, I want to move on to you, I think particularly also because probably some of the people watching this will be film programmers. Um, and you work, you know, uh, as opposed to the other two, you work more in a, a specific parameters for what you put on with Berlin Alley Shorts, you know, it's a certain amount of films and screenings every year. Um, and you work with a big team of, of selection, well, of your selection committee. So how does that work? How do you see collaboration as part of what you do with, with Berlin Alley Shorts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, at Berlin Alley Shorts, I decide which films will be shown in the end, yeah. but there is a long process of exchange, collaboration, and yeah, dialogue, discussion, conversations going on before that. So I wouldn't really, for what I do, use the word vision. I would rather use the word, because I don't have a vision of what I want this program to look like, because it depends on which films will be submitted. Mm -hmm. I'm dependent on the year, on, on the films that are being produced. So I would rather call it a handwriting maybe, but also a responsibility and an accountability. That's kind of my role as a curator in that context. And just to help you sort of understand the logistics, like we get 4,000 submissions, we can show around 25 films, this year only 20, but usually 25 films. And we have two and a half months with a committee of eight people and me to narrow 4,000 films down to 25. So there needs to be one person who in the end says, I'm sorry, this one out, and then yes, this one in, because otherwise we will never finish our job. And I'm, I'm, I very much admire how other festivals manage big numbers, but often these other festivals have, can show more films. Mm -hmm. That also makes it easier to have a more, let's say democratic approach to curating, because there are more slots, more films that can be screened. Yeah, so, um, and so I try to be very careful with the people I choose for the selection committee. As I said, it's eight people. And like myself, some of them are actually filmmakers. Uh, some of them come from academia. Some of them are specialized on curating for film. But um, let's say the filmmakers, most of them don't work for other festivals as well. So they come from the praxis, join the group and then disappear in their own projects again. So I think there is a sort of diversity happening there already in gazes and views. And 
And then when I can bring new people in, um, I, I try to make sure that they have a perspective, perspective that I don't have and that they're really good at something I'm not good at and have an expertise there. And yeah, listen to them when they say this film is really good. Anna, you haven't got a clue what's going on. I'll give you some context. I say, thank you. That's exactly why I asked you to join this group. Um, and, and I've worked for other festivals where the process is exactly the opposite, where five people have to agree on 80 films and we have four days just for that process. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's different kind of context. And when I, when I work with short salon, uh, it's interesting what Renaud said, because in that case, the collab collaboration happens with the hosts of the festival, or not, it's not a festival, it's always evenings, um, because we also don't have a space. And it's actually nice to have, not to have a space. And I, I just give you one example so you understand what Short Salon does. So for example, the big library here in Berlin, the, the America Gedenkbibliothek, they had a special season three months about climate change. And they asked us to curate an evening for that. So we picked three very experimental films that deal with climate change and nature and uh, also exploitation of nature. And we asked a landscape architect to take us on a walk after the screening in the library around the library and to show us what is nature that's just growing like that? What is nature that man made? And how does climate change actually affect the plants that are being planted and the ways a landscape architect in a city works with the plants and stuff. So it's, it's, it was a very nice way of opening the eyes. And now when I go through the streets, I suddenly realize, oh yeah, this is the tree he told us about that they are planting now because it's very good with heat and low water and so on and so forth. So this sort of opening the eyes for the banal and for the daily by having the short films as a common ground to start talking because the audience has seen them and we discuss them with the expertise of somebody who doesn't come from film. So we always invite people who don't come from film or media studies, but we wanna hear their, their expertise on the topic that the three films also discuss. And then we have a little activity, whatever makes sense in the context that we are invited into work. And, and yeah, so, so maybe that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I guess I want to um, maybe go into more practical ideas or, or, or tips on, on this sort of collaborative process in terms of particularly also working with the artists that you platform. Um, because obviously, I think, you know, like you're saying, you know, obviously, I, I agree that the, it's the point is not to squash an individual voice, but I think that individual voice is obviously responsible for recontextualizing works in ways that they were you know that they weren't necessarily intended to be in that context so um in terms of our sort of responsibility towards artists works how is, do you think there's any sort of especially when you work with curators are there any sort of strategies that you think of to have that process be as sort of engaged and in, 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 in depth as possible well um I guess there is, in working with curators, I guess there's always, uh, you know, uh, past experiences that you can share or stories that you can um, convey or advice that you can give in some ways to, um, to think about collaboration in, in a different way. I mean, just as we're doing now, I think, to, you know, to think about collaboration um, alongside this kind of, um, another sort of transactional and individualistic approach, which then leads us to think about uh, um, the relationship between a programmer and a host, as you know, as as we just have with, with also with what you said, Anna, I think is really fascinating because it broadens the idea of collaboration. Right, it's not just two artists working together on a common um, on a common artwork. It's it's a it's not a collective. It's you know it's something that is much broader to and embedded in everything that we do. And I think that's a really po powerful way of. Um, you know, once we identify among ourselves this way of working together, we can sort of see it, uh, I think, much more. But also, in terms of maybe just past experiences and advice, like I or, or concrete ways of 
uh, of uh, you know collaborating with with artists. Uh, I think the loss of control that um, that Ilaria talked about is just is you know is so perfect as a as a concept as a starting point. I think, um, and I was thinking about um, how an exhibition is in so many ways fundamentally an exercise of loss and control, right? Because we control everything as curators, you know, the lighting, the height of the works, which works goes in, which artists go in, which, you know, conversation um, it sort of uh, is the umbrella conversation, uh, the discourse of the exhibition. But then the one thing that we absolutely do not control is how the exhibition is read by the public and how and what people take out from, from you know, all this work of control. And I think to remember that and to sort of put it as, a, as uh, something that's central to, to curatorial practice is so important and really helps with collaboration and, and a more collaborative and open and generous practice, because ultimately we don't know what we're doing, which is beautiful. And I think we have to embrace it. And, um, and uh, it leads to better collaborations. And I think it's the same with artists, you know, you know, like the, uh, the um, just accepting that, that what you might have in, in mind might, is, might not be what, what comes out of that collaboration with, with an artist. Um, otherwise, I would say, you know, uh, which I think echoes also what Ilaria said earlier, talk about everything. Um, and it's actually not that hard uh, when it comes down to it to really find the right words to talk about absolutely everything, make sure that uh, your core values are very clear in a collaboration so that when you have to say no, people understand why you have to say no, right? It's not an ego trip. It's because you have certain limitations that you've clearly, you know, communicated. There may be budget limitations, but they may also be limitations because you have certain core values that ask that you do, you know, one thing over another. And so you're uncomfortable with what an artist might be asking. And so you can't maybe always be in complete agreement with everything, but there is always a sort of opportunity to um, to talk, you know, to talk through the reasons why you're not in agreement. I think not being in agreement is fine. It's just being able to explain why that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ilaria, do you want to? Sure. Um, so I think with artists, I mean, there are, ideal circumstances, less ideal circumstances. I think each project is different and you need to recalibrate right, yourself as to what is possible. But if we speak about ideal circumstances or in any case, how to go about certain things, I would say that what I've always been trying to cultivate is really long-term conversations. And I say artists, but of course, this can be collaborating curators or any other practitioner that is brought into a project. Um, because um, there is a huge value, I see a huge value, you know, in having um, collaborations and relations that exist before and after projects. Um, and that I think allows you to cultivate not only a genuine interest in the practice, but most importantly in the person. Um, in being best invested somewhat on a personal level is important, um, is a very important, I would say, step toward taking good care of artist practices and work because what they do is sort of entrust their work and what they do into your hands. So it's a huge responsibility um, in that sense. And I think that another element that I found, I have found very important, helpful, and for sure this applies also to altering, shifting, communing, but in general really to this discursive methodology that I was mentioning before is to create opportunities also to bring practitioners that might not know one another uh, or might not have had the chance to cross paths before to bring them together in that same space. So I'm thinking even just about group exhibitions or circumstances that can become complex because you have multiple personalities or multiple subjectivities to go back to what we were saying before at play at the same time. But thinking about sort of what are the shared urgencies, why we are there to do that kind of work. And I felt that in, in the past, I feel that it's been very rewarding and very, um, yes, I would say rewarding is the right word to, to see how these practitioners then become somewhat allies because of their approaches, their beliefs, 
or the type of work they develop, the political work that they do. And of course, with this, I do not refer to political ideas, but more to the agency that their processes, their thinking, their work um, nurtures. And again, going back to also what Renault was just saying, I think what's really, really important is to always be ready to make that extra effort uh, when communicating with others, um, it, to do that sort of constantly, accurately, properly, and not to try to, to skip corners, cut corners, or to make assumptions just because we have time pressure. We will always work under pressure, and that's just the nature of the work. But in a way to not skip steps that might be important for others, I think it's, it's very, very important. And with this, I just wanna close with this again, sort of putting on the table these little thinking tools that for me are very useful. And so I hope that maybe someone will pick them up and uh, in hopes that they're useful for them is this idea of, um, of owing and not owning this I take from Rolando Vasquez, who's a thinker uh, based in the Netherlands. And he speaks about this often as all of you were saying before, nothing, uh, nothing really of the work that we do is born out of nowhere. And it's just the product of our own thinking or our own intelligence, our own culture. It is part of a bigger genealogy of exchanges that we cultivate constantly with everybody. When we talk in the streets with people, when we talk in professional contexts here and so on and so forth. And so being always conscious of that, remind ourselves and also people around us that we have that degree of inter interdependence, you know, that we are not just coming up with brilliant ideas all of our own, but that we need to owe to others rather than just reclaim ownership of things, I think is a very important exercise also to try and do on a daily basis in the professional context, because maybe that's the key to the problematic aspect of curating and the word curator that we were sort of addressing um, before. That could be a path somewhat. Yeah, yeah, amazing, thank you. Um, Anna, do you want to respond to that? I'm also curious about how, what your views are on this, considering you're, you know, you're a, a video artist yourself. So you're, you've you experienced the other side of, of that. So I'm just, yeah, curious. Yeah, it's funny that you ask in this direction because I actually shifted my role while, while listening to you. I thought, OK, let's listen to this uh, from the perspective of a video artist. The thing is, when I do um, my work is always commissioned. I don't do any like and since it's always commissioned, it's always part of a bigger context. So let's say um, Bauhaus anniversary, a big anniversary exhibition. I do in a video installation for them or an exhibition about Sigmund Freud at the Jewish Museum or um, yeah, or it's an opera and, it, it, and the video is part of the backdrop of the desi stage design. So, so if you take my work out of that context, it doesn't make sense anymore. And that's why I don't really dare to call myself video artist because it's not an expression of whatever that I think about or do or want to express. It is using the tools of video to communicate something to an audience in a bigger context. And so, so I have to very much understand what my client, and I'm using the word client because it's not a curate, they are curators, but they are my bosses. They, I'm, they are my clients what they want, where they want to go. And I really have to listen carefully. And sometimes they know very well what they want and I just have to execute it. And sometimes they have a very vague idea that they cannot put into words. And then I give them, I make sample work and, and we go through a process together where I show them stuff and, and um, develop from there. But more and more they give me a carte blanche. So they, can, they actually let me do what I want. And then it's just up to me to figure out, okay, what is this bigger context uh, we're working in? And whenever there was a problem, I think the root was always either miscommunication and misunderstandings. So that's just something where you have to take time and talk about things again, as you mentioned before, or trust. Mm -hmm. And so far, trust always worked. But when I see, oh, there is a problem coming, I ask myself, is it because I don't trust them anymore or they don't trust me at the moment and where do I have to make sure to re 
reestablish that trust. And yeah. Yeah. I think, sorry, but I, 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 I love that. I think that's so true. And it's, it, I think that that's why, what I meant in some ways by talking about core values and like making sure that like the person in front of you that you're working with understands like the basis on which you are going to be making decisions. Because I think that's, that makes mm. it easier to um, keep, keep the trust that, you know, this, that kind of charitable trust that you give to someone where, you, you know, when you first start working together. Uh, but also regain the trust if there is a breakdown in communications, right? Like, mm. like yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to um, maybe from here continue on what was something that came up about um, audience and, you know, you're, you're saying whatever we do, we don't have control over how it's being received, how it's being read. Um, and then earlier there was um, a sort of note on the, the, the crisis of identity that the museum institution is going through, maybe the wider, maybe wider art institutions are going through. So I think um, it'd be interesting to sort of talk about ideas, approaches to, or, or like how you see what meaningful audience engagement can be and how that can be incorporated in a project from the outset. Because I think when you're talking about, you know, museums, big institutions, there's very often that quite traditional audience dynamic, you know, there's, it's, there, it's quite a detached, separated space a lot of the time. Um, and I'm wondering whether, you know, we, we deal with that obviously in a cinema, but I'm wondering about each of your ideas of how you nurture the conversations beyond that sort of surf, you know, that, that initial reception. I don't know, I don't know if you want to go first. Um, so how do you nurture the, how do you nurture the conversation with, sorry, how do you- how... Just in terms of just audience engagement that mm -hmm. it goes, that audiences, I guess, have potentially more involvement or a, a, a sort of more in-depth engagement beyond their entry to a space or, you know, their reception of a work. Like, what can we do to make that a more accessible, involving space, yeah. I guess? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think, uh, com complicated question uh, and, and uh, a, an answer that, uh, you know, I, I think is, for me, it's not, it's one of those things that just cannot be, um, you know, pinpointed uh, because it's sort of constantly evolving and each project is different, each audience is different. Um, and there is no, uh, you know, easy checklist on on how to do it and what constitutes like, you know, a great way to do it. Or, um, but, um, but I think that there, you know, it's it's um, it is true that we have to that um, there is a lot of very unintelligible uh, or or uh, sort of un un unintelligible language in what we do, right? Like, uh, and uh, the art world is also quite, uh, because of this, maybe because of this process of validation that we were, you know, uh, talking about earlier, uh, it's quite, it's, there's a lot of references and that can make the work that we do very difficult to access. Uh, and to just try to, you know, really think about what we present to to uh, our audience and and um, make sure that the the contextualizing tools are there, but not necessarily lose ourselves in a um, in a set of references that validates our own curatorial decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but trust that we are having a conversation with the audience, and that on its on it can stand on its own. Um, relinquishing the control of, uh, you know, being, or the, the uh, of, of articulating a, uh, an argument that will sort of win the appreciate, the validation of our peers. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead having this kind of, you know, I'm gonna quote Rax Media Collective since we can, <laughs> uh, I, but it's, it's probably a terrible quote, but I think it's, um, uh, well, it's, I'm, I'm, it's not a terrible quote, is I'm, I'm not going to remember the exact quote, but it's the idea that in engaging with your audience, you're writing a love letter to one person, but you're also talking to seven, seven billion people, right? So you kind of, you really want to 
have the immediacy uh, of uh, and the love and the care of a love letter to one person, but also that one person could be anyone in 7 billion people, the entire mm-hmm. planet, which I thought was very beautiful. So that's a bit ideal, but. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's as, a guiding, as a guiding thought. Yeah, I'll, I'll let the guiding co- thought go to, to Ilaria. I'm also just interested because Ilaria, you, work, you obviously work in quite a lot of um, big institutions as a curator. And I'm, I'm wondering how this conversation sort of also, um, whether you think as a curator, you know, understanding who your audience is and who you're working with, what pressure you can almost put on institutions in those spaces to improve representation and to improve access. Um, I know that was also very broad, <laughs> but yeah. Yes, I think it's a, that is definitely a constant struggle. I'm very transparent about it because I don't think, again, we need to sugarcoat situations. Oftentimes the role um, that I discuss with other colleagues that I've been trying to have myself, but again, maybe it's too idealistic to say, oh, I've been this thing, but at least what the direction in which one is trying to work is that of a hacker is the best analogy that I can find. So to try and, and hack certain mechanisms from within when working in these bigger institutions. Um, but um, going back to also to what Renault was saying, I agree that the process somewhat needs to be designed every time, every exhibition, every project, every context is different. And yes, you can know your audiences, but again, there's 7 billion people out there. And so you shouldn't feel too comfortable in knowing that you know, in thinking that you know who you're talking to, because if you get too comfortable, then probably you are replicating some form of elitist, you know, institutional politic for which you just choose your group and you just talk to those people in a way. Um, I think that for me, one important strategy is to try and think, and again, the discursive comes back as a methodology always. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but it's to try and maintain spaces alive in multiple ways. And I don't just mean with people, or with mediation or educators, although I recognize the full importance of um, sort of conjugating the language or the languages of contemporary art and that artists develop um, and sort of adapt them to other languages that could be the languages of someone who has never stepped into a museum of contemporary art or a contemporary art space. But with that being said, I think that keeping spaces alive also come, goes down to, comes down to um, what kind of forms of knowledge you cultivate in there, um, what kind of hierarchies of bodies and of these knowledges you establish through the way in which you think the space, and also to try and find solutions for engagement that maybe are a little bit less normative and perhaps considered through the validation system that Renault was mentioning, maybe less orthodox or less valuable, but instead that have great value when it comes to breaking the limit that the exhibition space is. The exhibition space is a physical space. It's a physical barrier, therefore. And so how do we break that dynamic? So I'm thinking about, and this I'm drawing from past projects I've been working on. And of course, these are not my ideas. They're communal ideas of the curatorial teams I've been working with. But thinking, for instance, about the presence of music, of concerts, what that can do in an exhibition space, because it brings in publics that, again, speak a different language. It's the language of music or of musicality and maybe not that of contemporary art, or also just envisioning different ways of engaging. So for us as curators, I feel that engagement oftentimes means really committed engagement. I come to an exhibition and I look at the works and I really understand what is going on and so on and so forth. But sometimes maybe that that also is a normative approach. So maybe there are other forms that we can cultivate. For instance, the space of rest, trying to create within exhibition spaces, spaces that are for resting and staying rather than consuming or being constantly subject to inputs or spaces that are about sort of a more of a social space um, spaces where you can offer something to drink or where people can meet and counter one another through small devices, small techniques or strategies that you implement through the space or spaces also of knowledge that 
um, maybe are a little bit more um, flexible. So collective libraries or spaces where you can engage with collector exercises without feeling the pressure of having to know things or having to belong to that space. I think that there are these other forms of engagement that are less intellectual, maybe less, again, established or normative, um, orthodox in a way. But I think they're as valuable as, because again, they all contribute to this notion that the barrier needs to come down and that the space of exhibition needs to become a form of public space, even if not in the public space. So how do we do that? I think all of these um, things are important. And then the reverse, and then I'll stop here, is when this, because of course there is always a degree of failure. There is a loss of control as Renaud was saying, but there is also a degree of failure oftentimes. You try to engage, you try to reach out to communities, to NGOs, to activists, to universities. You create groups that can do different things. Inevitably, you will not be able to engage everybody also because everybody does not exist. It's just a fiction of the institution in a way. So the other thing that you can do, however, is to reach those interstitial spaces, those liminal spaces that might not otherwise have access to your space in the first place. And I'm thinking of it about very basic things that, again, having worked in New York for many years, there were certain things that I was considering only up to a certain point that became much stronger when moving to Paris, how the, the underground system does not connect all neighborhoods, right? Which you have in New York, but you have in a much stronger way in, in Paris. And so that certain communities, certain neighborhoods, certain pockets of the city simply do not have space, do not have access to the centrality of space that a big museum right in the center of the city it might have. So can we reverse engineer and can we go and can we do that kind of outreach and can we do a re reversed type of engagement? I think that is also something that it's of course happening more and more. I'm not uh, saying something that it's out there. It's very much in the practice, but I think also it's a way through which institutions should continue to think about. One model that I'm very interested in is that of the library the fact that you have a network of smaller units of smaller elements and not just this big centralized space, that also is something that I think it's interesting when thinking about the big question of institutions that you mentioned right at the beginning of the question. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying about, um, you know, the, about reaching out and, and, and going into other spaces, it's obviously very important, but I think there's, there is often this sort of assumption that, you know, you look at it on a project basis and therefore the outreach is sort of often seen with quite a short sighted or short term approach where it is a sort of ongoing long term approach and a lot of places don't probably have the resources to maybe do that or the knowledge to do that. Um, which is why I think those, the spaces that you're talking about, these ideas of quiet spaces, safe spaces, resource spaces that can give maybe like new audiences this, this sort of comfort to engage, I think that's a really interesting, it's a really interesting idea. Um, and then I think from that idea of limited space, I want to go back to you, Anna, because um, you have, you know, you've got, like, as you said, you've got a big, big local audience, which is quite, you know, it's quite special for a festival like Berlinale. Um, and then obviously you've got such a huge industry contingent. Um, and is there a way for you, like, how do you see that balance, I guess? Um, you know, are, are there, is there a possibility for you to like really engage with the audience beyond the screenings or, and are there other, are there ways where you could see that be more meaningful or how you would want to see that? Mm. Yeah, so yeah, as I said before, I have the luxury that they come anyway. And for me, it's really important. I take my audience very serious. I take them serious as grown up people who I don't have to educate or tell them anything. This is a good film, this is, the art, the, the, I don't know, the best of the cinema world at the moment. So, so because that's also a misunderstanding very often about a festivals that it's like the competition and these are the best films. No, these are the films that I, little Anna, think are relevant at the moment and I want to share them with an audience. And yes, they have to fulfill a certain standard of quality so they can be part of the competition of Berlinale, but for, um, it's not so much about being an Olympics, but being a conversation ground or an art, yeah, an art and a cultural space. 
and also not so much of an industry space maybe because um because we are a in german say publicums festival mm -hmm. there are other festivals that cater very much for the industry where you don't have a general audience they can't even attend and we are quite we have to balance both this is exactly why you're asking i guess and so what since i take the audience serious in the sense that they want to engage that they want to think that they want to process what they watch we started two things one thing is uh, my predecessor already established it which is a blog and on the blog you find interviews you find all the press clippings we could find um, for the films and i ask members of my team that's the selection team, but also the office, up to the interns, to pick films they would like to write about. And it's called Through the Eyes Of. So it's not so much a film criticism, it's more like that's what I see in this film. And, and so everybody of the shorts team can write about one, two films, and we put that out there on the blog, and then people can do whatever they like with it. So that's one way that you can engage further when you come home, if you want to. And the other thing we established last year is that, so we have maybe five films in a program and we always have a short Q&A after each film, which I usually host. And we don't have the infrastructure or the possibility or the time to have an audience talk. It's only the host who, or my colleagues from the selection committee host them. And so we started one screening that's because we can show the programs five times or four times. And one of them is called Shorts Take Their Time. So our program is 90 minutes of short films and the cinema is blocked for us for three hours. And we talk as long as we want and the audience asks as many questions, comments or whatever as they wish. And then we go on to the next film. And yeah, we established it last year and it became really, really popular and the audience really seems to love it to sort of dive in deep. And in that case, we just had to make sure that people when they buy their ticket know that they're buying this kind of slot in case they're in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, they should maybe get a ticket for another screening. So that's the two things at the Berlinale. And then I always have the possibility to do two events, one with the Canadian Embassy and one, we have to see how that continues, but one in a special space where I try to do one for the general audience and one for the industry to get together. But the theme, I always try to invite people to talk or as a sort of kick off, kick off conversation or something that give us interesting examples of audience engagement and, and how short film can come to an audience. Existing films can be presented. Last year it was Wapikoni from the Canadian um, Film Collective um, in, in Indigenous Cinema. And I don't know what I'm gonna do next year. So the industry part at Berliner Le Shorts is always about how to get those films out there and not so much about how can I foster the career of this filmmaker and make sure that they make the next film or put them together with important people from the industry because there are other festivals that are much better at that. They're really good and established and have a very good network. And I think my job as an audience festival is thinking about the films that are there already, how can they reach and find interesting examples mm -hmm. how that's done. And maybe a last word about audience <clears throat> with short salon, as I told you with the library, we actually go to places where there is an audience that didn't expect us. So the people came to, to, to yeah, think about climate change and then they have, have to watch these three heavy experimental films that we selected. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and, um, and another example we did, uh, there is a, place with a lot of artist studios with for musicians and uh, recording studios and they have a garden and they asked us whether I want we want to do a screening in the garden and we thought okay what is what's the topic what shall, what kind of films and we talked and talked and talked and then in the end the topic of our three films was music politics and me and how yeah sort of that's the topic and in a, on a, in a footnote, they told us that every Friday, every first Friday in the month or something like that, there is a big open rehearsal of the big band. So we asked, can we do our screening after the open rehearsal or during the open rehearsal of the big band, of the brass band? And they said, yes, that sounds like fun. Let's do it like that. So suddenly this audience of the brass band <laughs> was confronted with three films 
under the headline of Music, Politics and Me. And it was open air in the summer and I was surprised. They were really, really focused and quiet. And a lot of them then subscribed to our newsletter. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we go to audiences where audiences don't really expect us because they are at that place anyway, for whatever reason. And then we see how we bring films that make sense in that context for them. And what I learned in that process is, we also did a screening in the local little cinema in the Bavarian village where I grew up. And I thought I picked really easy going Berlinale summer films for them to show in the winter. And they were really puzzled and didn't really know what to do with those films. And then I realized there isn't really, outside the film festival bubble, you are never confronted with short films unless it's advertising or little jokes. And I thought, okay, next time I will pick the same kind of films. It's not about making, presenting easier films or more easy to act, uh, consumable films. It's more about giving them a few words at the beginning that they can trust the film and trust themselves. Like it's totally fine if you don't understand the film. That's what this film is not about. It's more, it might do something to you. It's more a poem or it's more an atmosphere. So don't worry if you don't understand in the classical sense, or there might be films that don't have a moral at the end and tell you what to do as a lot of sort of short formats do. So what I'm trying to say is if we go to an audience that doesn't expect us, I also have to make sure that I give them the confidence and the trust and the ease and the joy and fun to just let go and just yeah. see what the film does. And it's okay if they don't like it. It's, that's not so much the question. And maybe coming back to what I said at the very beginning with the listening, I forgot to say one thing that's really important to me, listening without judgment, because judgment is usually pretty boring. And to create spaces where this kind of listening is possible and I'm not asked whether I like the film or not. I'm more like, and in English, um, in German, you always say, we find the student film. What do you, how do you find the film? In English, you can say, so what do you think about the film? Which mm -hmm. sounds awkward in German, which is a much nicer way to talk about films when you leave the cinema than the German. So we find the student film in the sense of, do you find it good or bad? Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, we've gone way over, yeah, we've gone way over time already, but um, not even half the questions. Um, but thank you very much. I, I was just, you know, before I before we fully wrap up, I was wondering if either of you have questions or comments to each other that you want to make. And don't worry if not. <laughs> I just uh, actually, sorry, uh, there's one thing that I, I really uh, want to say because I feel really inspired by this last question and this idea of, of audience engagement. I think uh, it's just, you know, but it, it's just so complicated, but I love the idea of which Anna you introduced of just simply going to wherever the audience is, right? Like we often think of audience engagement as like bringing the audience in, but um, I mentioned this project uh, any any given Sunday uh, which was a, a public art project in Cape Town in 2016, curated by Riasan Nedu. And we did a, a talk with Riasan a couple of weeks ago. It's on our website. Um, and it's, this was an example of, you know, art being brought like to unexpected, unsuspecting uh, audiences uh, in public spaces. And something completely else and different happens in a completely different relationship and engagement, right, uh, takes place. And uh, I think we, we should do more thinking about this because the institutions that many of us work for also have a reputation that uh, we have to overcome and that often audience engagement is in other words for overcoming that reputation, right? <laughs> so it's not so much about the, uh, the audience but it's about the image that the, the museum has uh, towards the audience. So anyway, we should have another maybe can I just add something very quickly? Because it's a very big institution that is used to be very good at that is the Berlin Philharmonics. The education department of the Berlin Philharmonics said, if the city doesn't come to us, we go to the city. And they did huge projects. Uh, yeah, it's worthwhile. If you want to know more about it, it's worthwhile digging in the, not the most recent education projects, but the older ones, how they 
yeah, just went into the city. And chiming on this and also answering to your comments on it, I think, yes, it is true that on the one hand, you need to have a certain degree of resources, but I'm also very much of a supporter of guerrilla methods, and I think that they work. So, for instance, for this show, I was telling you, Fondazione Borucello, we just brought the artists to the public park nearby, and we just were doing engagement just right there and then, rather than having the artist in our studio developing the work on her own. It's just a silly... Um, example. It's a small example, I would say, but I think that there are, I think it's a question of, again, going back to the urgencies and the needs and kind of deleting what we've been knowing so far in terms of structures and methodologies and try to do that kind of reverse engineering, starting from the sort of the end point and trying to trace back the process rather than just replicate um, what we know, which is a totally uh, valuable method. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, but I just guess that I'm just trying to say that it points in the different direction in the end, which is the one that Renault was talking about. It's about yeah. the revolution of the institution. Yeah, because I think that the, even the, the, the sort of phrasing of you know, lowering, lowering the barrier is in, in itself quite an institutional way of phrasing something. And I think it's the, the guerrilla spaces and the radical spaces that probably push institutions to, to move, you know? So I think this is, it's a nice note to end on. <laughs> um, so again, thank you all. Thank you very much for being here. Please stay online for a second. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who's watched. Um, this is gonna be online very soon um, for anyone who wants to rewatch it. And thank you to all funders, partners, and all the staff and tech crew who have made this run very smoothly. Um, and then there's several days of Vienna Shorts to continue over the next, until Tuesday, I believe. So please delve in and thank you very much. Thank you, Sunny. Thank, Thank you. you.